it's the most prestigious racing series in the entire world. It's the pinnacle of speed, power, and skill. The most advanced cars on the planet, driven by the most skilled racers, period. The drivers are going 100 miles an hour faster than planes taking off. It's the world's top manufacturers fighting on the most glamorous circuits to see who can build the best race car in the galaxy. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Formula One. In the early 1900s, rich guys were racing their fancy jalopies from town to town around Europe in hastily organized contests called Grand Prix. It was like that part of the Great Gatsby when they go racing in Leonardo DiCaprio. Anyway, World War II happens, blah, 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 you can't race anymore, but it didn't take long for people to start racing after the war ended. In 1947, the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile, or FIA, was founded. The FIA immediately created a bunch of racing series centered around Grand Prix style racing, with the top tier called Formula A, which quickly turned into Formula One. The only rule was that the engines couldn't be bigger than two and a half liters and they had to be naturally aspirated. Besides that, the sky was the limit. These new engines and rules brought new teams to compete with the old. While the old timey Gatsby race teams generally had old timey drivers, newcomers like Lancia and Mercedes had to get drivers of their own. Both companies set out to hire the best available. Lancia hired an Italian, Alberto Ascari, and Mercedes hired Argentinian born Juan Manuel Fangio. These guys were insane. Tearing down backcountry roads, wearing nothing but a leather helmet and a crazed grin. They didn't even have seat belts. Fangio and Mercedes were a dominant pair, having won the 1954 and 1955 seasons back to back. But after a horrific accident involving one of its cars at Le Mans, killing 83 spectators, Mercedes decided to abandon motorsport altogether. Almost simultaneously with Mercedes' departure, crashes would also force Lancia out and sadly take the life of a scary. Lancia sold all of their Formula One equipment and development to Ferrari and just washed their hands of the entire sport. Ferrari would take the development from Lancia and hire the now jobless Fangio, who would win the 1956 championship. He then left Ferrari for Maserati and won another championship. In 1957, he decided to retire from racing when he was kidnapped by Fidel Castro. Pretty wild, wild stuff. Google it, it happened. In 1959, the Cooper Racing Team made an innovation that would change racing and cars forever. The team moved the engine from in front of the driver to behind his little butt. This totally changed how the car drove and made it way better. By 1961, every team was using a mid-engine layout in their cars, and they still do today. At the start of the 1967 season, British Team Lotus would introduce the Ford Cosworth DFV 3 liter V8 to the world. It powered the now legendary Lotus 49. Lotus had exclusive rights to the engine for one year, but it was so good, every team wanted it, and it would go on to power almost every Formula One car for the next decade. Ferrari, being Ferrari, didn't want to use somebody else's engine, so they built their own. Figuring more is more, they tried to combat the V8 with a flat 12. Not only did these things sound amazing, they also made a ton of power. With almost everybody using one of these two engines, smaller teams started using any technological innovation that they could sneak past the rules. Soon, some insanely experimental cars were hitting the grid, including four-wheel drive racers, cars with six wheels, and even a car with a fan to suck it to the road through corners. Jessica. The 70s were a perfect balance of rock star attitude and technical innovation. And no two drivers of this period embodied that yin and yang better than Nicky Lauda and James Hunt. Lauda was a reserved and meticulous Austrian who drove for Ferrari. And Hunt was a rowdy playboy type, much like myself. who drove for McLaren. Off the track, these two respected each other, but on it, there might never be a fiercer rivalry. Their story is so good that a few years ago, they made a big old Hollywood movie about it. It's called Rush. Also, check out the sequel, Rush More. I like your nurse's uniform, guy. These are OR scrubs. Oh, are they? 
In 1977, Lotus introduced an evolving ground effect aerodynamic kit, which not only increased downforce, but also reduced drag. The Lotus didn't rely on wings pushing the car down, but shaped the bottom of their car like an upside down airfoil. This essentially made the entire car a wing with none of the drag. Whatever 70s stuff they were smoking, I want some. I'm just kidding, pot sucked in the 70s, ask your grandma. Oh my Lord, please don't use that language in front of me. All good things must come to an end and the Cosworth engine could not last forever. In 1978, Renault introduced forced induction to the sport. While every team for the past decade Decade had used a naturally aspirated three liter engine, the rules also allowed an engine half the size with forced induction. Up until 78, teams had figured that with the technology available at the time, any competitive turbocharged engine would be too laggy and any supercharged engine would be too inefficient. Renault had recently used turbos at Le Mans and decided to roll the dice and see what a little boost could do for Formula One. And it turns out a little boost goes a long way. The aging DFF could only muster about 500 horsepower in its most developed form, but Renault's turbo motor was matching that power on its very first outing. Soon after a bit of development, Renault was making 700 horsepower and the rest of the constructors began to take notice. While the turbocharged 80s of Formula One only lasted for a few short years, there is no denying that they dominated. The insane power to weight ratios meant that drivers achieved speeds and times previously only dreamed Leaned up cementing their names in the history books. Drivers like Ayrton Senna, Nigel Mansell, Alain Prost, all made their names racing these turbocharged beasts against each other. FIA introduced a new set of rules in 1987. They stabilized power numbers, reined in development costs, and increased the naturally aspirated engine size to 3.5 liters. When the turbo engine's power numbers still reigned supreme, FIA outright banned the use of turbochargers in 1989. Luckily for Formula One teams, the increase of displacement combined with improvements in engine technology meant that many of these new NA motors were essentially as fast as their turbocharged predecessors. Although power could no longer be turned up for qualifying. Turn up! With these new engines, drivers like Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost continued to set blistering lap times. Further technological developments such as active suspension, semi-auto gearboxes, and traction control not only made these times even faster, but seemed to make the sport safe to a degree only dreamed about in the past. By 1994, F1 had gone almost an entire decade without a death. While there had still been injuries in that time, no one had died, and the sport had a sense of invulnerability about it. This was crushed in a spectacular and horrifying way when at the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix, three drivers were involved in terrible crashes, two of which were fatal. The most dramatic of these crashes and the one with the longest lasting impact was that of the legendary driver, Ayrton Senna, who at the time of his death was a triple world champion and arguably the best F1 driver of all time. His death would prompt a number of rule changes, all aimed at slowing down the cars. The most notable changes were the reduction of engine size back the three liters and the addition of a wooden plank on the underside of the car. When the car is forced down by aerodynamic forces, the plank wears away as it rubs against the ground. They measure it at the end of the race and if it's worn down too low, then that car's aerodynamics are illegal. This practice continues to this day. Now that means that these million dollar race cars made of carbon fiber with more fins than a lionfish, capable of driving upside down in a tunnel, they all have a piece Piece of wood strapped to the bottom. Following the tragic 1994 season, the Formula One grid was left scrambling as they tried to conform to the FIA's flurry of new rules. Over the next 10 years, improvement became the name of the game rather than innovation. The new three liter requirement lent itself to a V10 engine layout, balancing power and fuel consumption. Out of this scramble, new names would appear and Michael Schumacher won his first championship in 1994. This guy won so much that people started getting bored. It seemed like the German national anthem was Formula One's theme song. For instance, in 2004, Schumacher took first in 13 out of 18 races. And he got second twice. You fucking kidding me? Dude didn't podium three times. I bet he partied so hard that year. <laughs> 
This earned him his seventh world championship, finally breaking Fangio's record that lasted 47 years. But it was becoming too expensive for the smaller teams to compete in the sport. So in 2006, the FIA mandated the switch to cheaper, smaller V8s, which also sounded sick. <laughs> And the cost cutting came just in time. Because in 2008, a global market recession hit F1 like a wrecking ball. I came in like a wrecking ball. Strangely, many smaller teams were able to weather the storm. While almost every major manufacturer, such as Jaguar and BMW, were forced to leave the series. This is due to the fact that while racing was the lifeblood of many of these small teams, that wasn't the case for big manufacturers. Following the slow bounce back of the global economy, Formula One would once again initiate rule changes. Beginning in 2014, Formula One again looked to turbocharging as FIA had mandated that all cars must run a 1.6 liter V6 hybrid turbocharged engine, which could not use more than 100 kilograms of fuel in an hour. These engines produced a consistent 600 horsepower, but could boost their output at certain times using an onboard system called curves, which recovers energy otherwise wasted under braking. When boosted, these engines could make 750 horsepower just like their predecessors. And it is these engines which are on the grid for this 2018 season. So what's new for this year? Drivers are now protected by a halo, a bar that shields their heads from large pieces of debris like tires in the event of a crash. Some people say the halo takes away from the open cockpit nature of F1. These people are turds. Lewis Hamilton is the current champ driving for Mercedes. Ferrari's close behind though, with Red Bull right behind them if they can figure their car out. F1 has such a long and rich history that there's no way that we can talk about everything in one episode. Formula One has always been the pinnacle of motorsport. It's inspired generations of rivalries and brought generations of people together. It's given us heroes and it's taken them away. There really is nothing like it. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Formula One. Hit that subscribe button. The more subs we get, the more cool stuff we can do with you guys. The season started last weekend. What do you guys think? Who's gonna do it? Follow me on Instagram, at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut on Instagram, at Donut Media. Fernando Alonso, will he make a comeback this year? Nolan thinks so. Check out this episode of Wheelhouse. You like race cars? How about race cars for the street? Check out this episode of The Bestest. I love you.